Hello! In this video, I'd like to talk a bit about how digital video is stored on a computer. And I'm not talking about H.264 or VP9 compression, that's a completely separate and difficult topic, and we'll refer to that later. What I want to quickly describe is the year of encoding. So you've probably been told that computers store images and display images as RGB. And this is true to an extent. If you take a magnifying glass and you look at your monitor, you will see red, green, and blue subpixels. And similarly, if you'll take a look at a CMOS sensor on a camera with the Bayer filter, you'll see it's red, green, green, blue. So it would make sense then to assume that if I record a video, it would be saved as red, green, blue, right? Because that's how it's captured and that's how it's displayed. Wrong. Videos are not usually saved as red, green, and blue. Instead, they're usually saved as Yov. What is Yov? Well, Yov is also three bits of information, um, or I guess three parts of the information, just like RGB has three parts. RGB happens to divide the three parts as the brightness, the luminance of the red channel, the brightness of the green channel, and the brightness of the blue channel. Um, you know, each of those usually go from 0 to 255 in an 8-bit recording, uh, where 255 would be like full red, green, or blue, and then 0 would be essentially black. Now, this isn't used for a couple of reasons, and the main one is that it's inefficient. Can you see why it's wasteful to have the same darkness or brightness information encoded three times? It's wasteful. How exactly does the YIV color space work? It isn't something that was invented for digital video. It, in fact, predates all digital video. YIV uh, color space encoding has been in use since the color television. Um, namely because of something, some, namely because of backwards compatibility with black and white televisions and stuff. Uh, that's a separate discussion, though. So here's how YIV works. YIV also has three parts to the three information parts. The first part, Y, is the luminance. Uh, essentially, luminance means the brightness of that pixel. Um, so you're going to save from a value of usually zero to two fifty-five, for example, how bright that pixel is. You don't save the color of the pixel. Wait, 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 wait a second. Isn't that, doesn't that make a black and white picture if you're just saving the brightness? And it does. If you were to only display the white channel, you would essentially get a black and white image. Um, this again predates to, if you have a color television that can't read the URV plane, you will get just the white channel, which is black and white. Now, there's a couple of side points I'd like to talk about here. First, remember that the human eye is most sensitive to luminance, not chromatins. You're not particularly good at telling the difference between two colors. You're very good at seeing contrast, though. For example, um, dark t-shirt on front of a light-colored wall. Whereas, you don't really care as much about the color, you care about the contrast. This makes sense, given evolution. So, the luminance uh, is actually a weight signal. Um, you don't just take the luminance of any of the R, G, or B channels. Instead, there's a mathematical formula that I will put on screen now that explains how to combine the red, green, and blue channels and take, com take the combined brightness of them. Um, the conversion, by the way, uh, is mostly green uh, because the human eye tends to be most sensitive towards the color green, and that's where your rod's vision range mostly falls. All right, um, so then what about U and V? UV is often defined as the UV plane. Here comes math again. Instead of being on a scale from something like 0 to 255 each, it'll, of course it's represented as some number digitally, but often on the plane it's represented as somewhere from like negative 0.5 or a negative value to a positive value like 0.5. And usually you'll lay the plane out and U and V. Now what is this plane? Well, one axis is the red axis and one axis is the blue axis. Uh, Tony, wait a second. Uh, what happened to the color green here? Um, you know, RGB. You only we, we can only display magenta pictures now this way. What are you? What, what are you talking about? Um, the way this works is that essentially the colors are additive or subtractive. Normally, the way you always think of if you're talking about the RGB color space is that it's usually additive. You start with black and you'll add bl red or add blue. In this case, if you're actually at neutral, you have what is essentially gray. Because remember, this plane doesn't include the luminance brightness information. It only describes the color. We don't care about dark red versus light red or dark blue versus versus big bright blue. 
that is going to be described by the luminance channel. Instead, we care about the tone of the color. So usually, the base tone for this will be some grayish color, and we're going to be applying particular hues to it. So, here's how this works. If I want to display red, I'm going to go up on the red axis. If I want to display blue, I'm going to go up on the blue axis. To display magenta, you go up on both the red and the blue axes. Makes sense. To get green, we're actually going to go into the negative red and negative blue axes. Cyan will be achieved by being pos will be achieved by being positive in the blue but negative in the red axis. And yellow will be achieved by being positive in the red but negative in the blue axis. Uh, this is easy to understand once you're looking at the plane of it. Um, you might already have seen a very similar principle of this without ever reading up about digital video. If you have an old cable TV receiver or DVD player, maybe it has a component output. That's the one where the outputs are just for video and labeled red, green, blue. So you'll end up with five cables, red, white for audio, and then red, green, blue for video. As a kid, I always thought that just represented the red, green, and blue pixels on the screen. No. Um, this has many advantages to composite video, by the way. That's a separate discussion. Composite sucks because it'll take the chrominance and luminance and sync slash clock, chuck them into the same channel, uh, and that's why you will end up with flickering in the colors or random artifacting. S-Video is slightly better in that regard because at least it separates the image from the clock, but it still combines luminance and chrominance, whereas, comp whereas component will split the channel into what I'm, what I'm discussing here a luminance, a red, and a blue plane. Well, luminance and then a red-blue plane. Um, and in that case, actually, the red and blue cables carry the corresponding uh, red axis and the blue axis, and the green cable carries the luminance signal. So you can actually just plug in the green cable uh, and you'll get a black and white picture. Now that scheme used by component video is called YPBPR. Uh, they describe slightly different things, but are very similar in principle. Um, and that's similar to the principle that I'm talking about here. So back to digital video. I said that it's advantageous because you don't, you get to re get rid of the redundant information, but I still said that there's still three channels, just like there were three in RGB. The redundancy, as I said, was because each channel doesn't need to convey the brightness of each pixel. Instead, we can keep the color and brightness separate. But here's where our efficiency starts to go up. Since the days of color analog television, we haven't stored the full color data in each frame. I talked about this in my YC CMOS sensors tend to have more blue noise video. I'm not sure if that one's been published yet. Early ATSC and NTSC television in color was broadcast in Yov 422 chroma subsampling. When you're subsampling, that's exactly what it sounds like. You take, you take a subset of the total set of chromas, which are colors. So let's start with the basic one, 444 chroma subsampling. This is storing all luminance and all color information for each pixel. Why four? Uh, take a group of four pixels, um, and this is like basically um, like two by two. And for each pixel, you're storing both the luminance channel and both the U and V chroma channels. Um, this means that if I'm watching a full 1080p video in Yov 444, I will get the full chrominance and luminance information in each pixel in each frame. Similarly, uh, most computer screens are negotiate over HDMI and DisplayPort negotiate and connect over 444 color. If you have a, if you, some TVs tend to only like using 420 color on 4K connections, particularly old 4K TVs. You'll notice this because if you open red text on a blue background, your resolution will suddenly drop to a quarter and I will talk about 420 color later. But essentially you want to basically, for stuff like text, you want to use 444 color um, just so that you maintain the full resolution. And if you have the luxury, 444 video of course looks better in terms of color resolution. Would you be able to pick out the difference? You can when you zoom into it. Uh, without zooming into it, um, it depends. And realistically, you would need to have some sort of test pattern because you're not going to see the color difference between like the shirt or like in the wall. 444 color is great, but it takes up more space than we need to, especially because you're probably not going to notice it. So we can get rid of some of that chrominance information. 
And in the old days of TV, they used 422 color. What is 422 color? Well, in 422 color, if we group the pixels again, you'll have the full luminance information in each pixel. You'll have both the red and blue subchannels in every other pixel. So going for each row, in each row, basically, you'll have a column that has Yuv and a color that is just Y. Then a color that has Yuv, then a color that has just, then a column that has just Y. So that means that if I'm looking at a just a single um, row of pixels, I'll have all three, then just luminance, then all three, then just luminance. Uh, and the next row will be the same as this. So basically you'll have columns where you have everything and columns where you don't have um, the color information. And realistically, people didn't notice. It has been this way, at least in North America, since color television became standard. I would guess that the reason they chose to left out every other column instead of every other row is that columns, the, the way scanning works is you start at the top left corner and like the way our most, like the way our eyes read, you'll read in a column and you will read all the columns in a row first, then go to the next row, then go to the next row, so on and so forth. So you actually need to work a lot harder if you wanted it in every single column because the frequency, your horizontal clock frequency is going to be a lot higher than your vertical clock frequency. Your vertical clock frequency will be just 50 or 60 hertz, 60 in North America. Whereas your horizontal clock frequency, that's like 15 to 16 kilohertz. Now, in digital video, we rarely use 422 color. The most common one is 420 color. And what is 420 color? In 420 color, if I take a 2x2 two two group of pixels, each pixel, once again, just indica as indicated by the first four, contains the luminance information. So, for 1920x1080 pixels on a 1080p video, every single pixel will contain the luminance information. But, the 20 means that for every four pixels, I'll have just Y, YU, YV, and just Y. So, there will be one pixel that has the luminance and the red channel, and one pixel that has the luminance and the blue channel, and two pixels that have just the luminance. This is a lower resolution than television, which was both red and blue in every other pixel. Now there's red in every four pixels and then blue in every four pixels. So it's half the color resolution. I guess one maybe good thing is it's more evenly distributed that you have red, nothing, nothing blue. Like it's, at least it's a checkerboard pattern, maybe. But this means that in every two by two group of pixels, only one has the red, one has the blue. So you only get color in these two by two grids, which means that for a 1920 by 1080 video, your color resolution is actually 960 by 540. For a 720p video, your color resolution is 640 by 360. For 4K, the fancy 4K video you're watching, this is what I was saying in the introduction. Your luminance, the luminance channel is actually 4K because each pixel contains the brightness information. But the color resolution is only a quarter because it's missing three out of every four red pixels and three out of every four blue pixels. So you'll end up with 1920 by 1080 color resolution. Are you likely to notice this? Probably not. But as I mentioned earlier, some 4K televisions connect over 420 color instead of 444 color. In this case, it's very noticeable because if you have, say, a color desktop wallpaper and you have your text in a different color on it, uh, particularly if you have red text on blue or blue text on red, that text won't be as crisp as it should be. And that's because on a 4K TV, instead of that text being 4K, it's actually only 1080p. Because if I have full blue and I have full red, for the computer, that's the same luminance information. They're both luminance 255. And the only difference is the chrominance information. So you're going to get a quarter of the resolution. Does this happen often? No. And if I had white text on blue background, it wouldn't happen because the brightness would be, the, the luminance is different. If I have white text on black background, the luminance is different. You don't get this, this effect. Only really happens when you have a color on another color. And once again, you usually care more about contrast anyways. Um, so it'll be fine. Basically, your black and white version will still be full 4K. And most text happens to be light colored on a dark background or dark colored on a light background because, surprise, it's a lot easier to read text when there's contrast between it as opposed to if it were just a different color. So, as a side effect of this approach, you end up with you know, higher black and white resolution than you do color resolution, which is a fine sacrifice. 
Next time you watch a video, I guess you can remember that you're only getting a color of the color resolution as you are the black and white resolution. Again, this is completely different from compression. Video compression happens after this. And of course, poorly compressed video or video that's been compressed a lot is going to look worse than lossless video. I'm talking about just a raw video being stored in this format. Even this camera shoots video in your 420. That means that even if I edit in 444, which I wouldn't because it just hogs your CPU, you're missing, uh, you're missing the color already. But again, dark color, light background, darker color, lighter background. So it works out. Why would we do this? Surely in modern computers, we're not worrying about CPU power or something anymore, are we? And you'd be correct, we're not. The main advantage of this happens to be to save bandwidth. If you're not, it's like compression, right? If you're not going to notice a difference, why have it take up the bits? By doing this, your video is half the size. Think about it. I have one full resolution picture and then two quarter resolution pictures. That That's going to work out to one plus quarter plus quarter equals 1.5 of the three full resolution frames that would normally have to be sent. This means that 1.5 divided by three, that's half the size. By doing your 420 color, before you even get to the compression stage, your raw video is going to be half the size as if it was full 444 color. And at that point, full 444 color would be the same size as full RGB color. So instead of storing videos as RGB, um, before I went off on this huge tangent about your color and chroma subsampling explained, your video, instead of RGB, which would be like you 444, you'd end up sending three full frame pictures, um, your video is half the size. This isn't just a thing for YouTube, it's you can end up you can get away with slower video processing your, your videos take up half the space on your hard drive or ssd or sd card um and if you're not noticing the result that's great that means that we have 50 percent savings in storage which also means we also have a decent amount of savings when it comes to compute power of course if you are a true fanatic and you need the full color because you want to look at rgb noise and static and it's full resolution or you want a picture that's a rainbow with a different color in each pixel uh you're going to notice the effect of this when that whole thing gets smudged out and becomes garbage um in which by the way if you were if you were trying to send bit for bit different colors uh in every single bit you would want to use your 444 but just be careful because if you upload it to a site and it gets transcoded it's probably going to get transcoded to 420 color Thank you for watching this very long and rambly video on, our, first of all, I guess we started with RGB versus Yov uh, and how videos aren't stored in RGB. And then this whole sidetrack of why you might want to do that. And to explain that, we have to go to, well, the answer is less bandwidth. But to explain that, we need to first discuss chroma subsampling and all of that. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you learned many things from this video. If you learned stuff, consider liking the video and commenting down below. I have no idea if people like these types of more rambly but slightly more educational videos uh historically i guess i've been trying to stick more so to tutorials but you know i thought maybe i'd try my hand at explaining stuff so hopefully you learned something um thank you so much for watching i guess subscribe if you want to see more videos like this or leave a comment if you like this type of video thank you and have a great day bye